you're really great at your job. Here's a raise. Here's a promotion. Here's an acceptance into the Harvard Business School or whatever. I mean, those things give just big, big dopamine hits. And they and they, they say, I'm coming back for more. And so what people do is that they habitually get used to wanting a new hit. I mean, just wanting the, you know, the monkey who wants the banana again and again, boom, 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 boom. The trouble is you can't keep any satisfaction from that. And because Mother Nature wants you coming back for more. Mother Nature loves that hedonic treadmill, wants you running on it like a, you know, it's like, like an animal. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the show today. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. This idea leads to another key facet of the book that I want to discuss that I hadn't heard before, the success addiction. Mm. So many of us, and certainly you know this, working with MBA students, like we are through school wired to compare ourselves to others, to rank, to score, to place above. There's this never ending comparison that's going on through young adulthood to, to strive to reach this great success in our career. And it seems to me like it does create a success addiction. Who doesn't want the gold star? Who doesn't want to be in the honors class? Who doesn't want to be accepted to Harvard Business School? What does that say about our, our mental health and happiness? And if we find ourselves in this success addiction state, how do we kick it? Well, so success addiction is like any other addiction. It implicates the dopaminergic pathways in our brains. And dopamine, as everybody knows at this point, because of the wonderful books that have come out by, you know, by Anna Lemke at Stanford and you know, a bunch of really important books, and, and you guys have talked about it on your show, that the dopamine is implicated in all addictive processes and it's the rule it's basically it lights up your reward circuit so you do something you like it you get the little hit you get the little success hit and that gives you a little bit of dopamine that that might be you know a line of coke it might be smoking a cigarette it might be you know playing bingo i don't know but you when you know, when you're really going to get it is when somebody's like you're really great at your job here's a raise Here's a promotion. Here's an acceptance into the Harvard Business School or whatever. I mean, those things give just big, big dopamine hits. And they and they, they say, I'm coming back for more. And so what people do is that they habitually get used to wanting a new hit. I mean, just wanting the, you know, the monkey who wants the banana again and again. Boom, 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 boom. The trouble is you can't keep any satisfaction from that. And because Mother Nature wants you coming back for more. Mother Nature loves that hedonic treadmill, wants you running on it. Like a, you know, it's like, like an animal, like keep running, man, keep running, man, keep, and, and, and so that, the success addiction is not, you know, has no indictment of capitalism. Capitalism's awesome. It can happen in any, any situation where, you know, even at, I mean, the most selfish, self-absorbed people I've ever met are in socialist systems where they, you know, grab all the goodies. And I mean, this is a human problem, not even an economic problem. And so you hit it, you hit the lever, you hit the lever, you hit the lever again and again and again until all you know how to do to the exclusion of your relationships, to the exclusion of your interests, to your the exclusion of your the education and the cultivation of your your moral capacities is all sacrificed on the altar of success because you got to hit the lever again and again. And I think when we talk about money, power, pleasure, fame as these false gods, a lot of it is again taking from others, right? Money, the transaction, we want more of it, whether it's from our boss, whether it's from our company, or if we sell power, we want to have control over others, we want to be able to boss others around. Pleasure, we talked about sex, again, trying to get others to, to fall in line and then fame, the, the chasing of others' attention. So much of this, I see patterns in my own behavior, going through school, going to graduate school, and then getting some success in entrepreneurship. And there are moments where you compare yourself to others and you feel much like we talked about looking at some of these guests and even the, the passenger on the plane behind you that you look up to them and you're like, they have it figured out. And a lot of the people we look up to have money, have power, have what seems like endless amounts of fame and, and pleasure in their lives. Why is this glorified in society? Why are those false gods what are at the forefront? And if they're not necessarily the ones that lead to happiness, what should we be pursuing? Yeah, so the, the, the reason that we idolize the people who are following the idols, as it were, is because we just don't really know another way. 
you know, people are pretty simple creatures. Uh, there are people, of course, who do. If you go to the Dalai Lama, he's not going to say, you know, work a 16-hour day. He's going to say, call your mother. He's going to say, you know, spend time in meditation. He's going to tell you these things that actually do bring rewards. I mean, there's the, the four idols, money, power, pleasure, and fame. And then there are the four uh, things that really do bring happiness, which are faith, family, friends, and, and sanctified work in the service of others, where you really earn your success. And, and so we, we go for the easy lure because our brain keeps lying to us. Our brain keeps tricking us. It's this gaudy plumage of the, you know, that says, you know, over here, I'm a, you know, big and beautiful, the whole thing, but it turns out that you're just, you know, a bird that's got that tail. And, and, you know, your brain is, is, is trained to do that. And we just haven't gotten over that. A few people do, you know, I'm hoping that we could, and this is every time, by the way, when there's a religious revival, a whole lot of people are like, I'm not happy. I don't like it. The world's lying to me. This is not enough. And then a whole lot of people try to become enlightened. And there's a non-trivial number of people who are enlightened, but the, the lumpen masses of people are just running on their treadmills again and again and again because their brains are lying to them and they're believing the lies. Well, this brings up an interesting topic, or at least a sidebar, which you worked in D.C. You were working in, in a think tank. I would imagine then because of that in your career, you know and friends with quite a lot of politicians. They know this science as well as anybody else. We... It's not like this is secret. It's not like you've cracked a code that, that, that has come out of uh, sideways. So we know what makes us happy. We know what makes a strong society. We know what makes us excited to take on the day. So why is the messaging that we're getting just so all over the map? And I'm, I'm sure there's many different answers to this, but I would like to hear your take on it after... Uh, studying this, but also working in that atmosphere. We drop great content each and every week, and we want to make sure that you guys get notified. And in order to do that, you're going to have to smash that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And if you've gotten a lot of value out of this, make sure you give us a like and share our videos with your friends. Well, part of it is that the messages that we get to do the wrong thing are just a lot easier to sell because they're very short term and they're intuitively, they seem right. I mean, it's look, it's, it's what do you see a billboard for? Cheetos and Pepsi. You know, that stuff is terrible for you and it'll make you feel horrible. It'll it'll taste really good in the moment, but it'll be really bad for your health. And if you binge on it, and that's all that I see, it's a big drink of Pepsi there. So the, uh, <laughs> like, speaking of which. The, it's bubbly. Mm. It's bubbly. <laughs> that's right. Soda break. There you go. There's bubbly. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> that, you know, th this is an easier thing to sell. I mean, the short termism is easier to sell. It's it, it's more, it sounds intuitively correct, but it's not. You don't see a big billboard saying, Eat un, you know, unflavored, non-fat Greek yogurt with, with protein powder in it, which is my habitual dessert because I'm a freak, right? But And so politicians, they're people too, and they're selling fear instead of love. They're selling short-termism instead of something that's more nutritious because people hit that bait a lot more frequently. We're, we have access to the to the best in, in messaging in the world. We have access to the best marketers in, in the world. We don't need to throw up billboards that say, eat this terrible tasting thing because it's good for you. We can massage that message really well and fire people up about a more healthier lifestyle, which we all know everybody needs right now in the middle of this pandemic. Right. No, that's absolutely true. But, but again, your brain lies and your brain says, and it, but your, your executive function is inhibited by the desires that you have, your ancient desires that you have. You know, you're 500,000 years ago, if there was something sweet, something that was highly glycemic, you'd go to the top of a tree and risk your life to get it because it would be, you know, fast calories. Well, we're maladapted to that at this particular point in our lives. And so the result of that now is that that, that Doritos billboard is the, the equivalent of the banana at the very top of the tree. And, that, and we're still cavemen. We have not evolved to the point where we actually desire the stuff that's good for us. Well, even if we take that to its logical conclusion, that billboard for Doritos, well, Doritos are far cheaper than the healthier foods. <laughs> when you load things up with chemicals, when you in artificially sweeten and artificially load up with fat that isn't found in that combination in nature, well, it's the easy way to money. We look at politics, it's the easy way to power. To stay in power is to demonize the other side. That's the easiest way to get reelected 
again, that false god. When you talked about the four things that we should be chasing, the one that Johnny and I have started to discuss and we're seeing more and more in our clients is work and the lack of meaning found in work. We've talked about this great resignation and you can go into the data of who's actually quitting their jobs. But even outside of that, I mean, some of my coaching clients now that I'm talking to are asking me questions of how do I find my purpose? How do I find meaningful work? I don't like this current state of work where I'm no longer in an office. I don't feel connected. There's no community. My coworkers and I barely interact. I'm forced to work from Zoom, feeling quite isolated. And then when I think about what I'm doing, well, I'm helping someone else in a leadership role worship the unhealthy God of money, <laughs> of power, of fame. I I'm not actually doing anything meaningful. How do we find what would be meaningful work for ourselves, for those who are in our career, not happy with our current prospects? Yeah. And the same question is, how could we actually help create that for people who work for us? So a lot of people who are listening to us right now have employees and they don't want everybody to quit. And even if they don't quit, they don't want them to be miserable because they're ethical, decent human beings. There are two characteristics to a job that will make it a source of happiness. They have, they're not money. They're not they're not position, they're not authority, they're not power. No, no. They're earned success and service to others. Those, that, I mean, I don't care if you're a bus driver or a podcaster or a Harvard professor or whatever you happen to do, you will be unhappy with your job if you don't feel like you're earning your success, if, you're, if your accomplishments are not rewarded, if you're not recognized for things that you're doing well, if your skills don't meet your passions, if you're not creating value with your work. That's earned success. The opposite is what, what psychologists call learned helplessness where you, know, you don't get a reward for what you do, but you also don't get a penalty when things don't go right. Your skills aren't meeting your passions, so you kind of give up. You learn helplessness, and there's a lot of experiments with people and with animals, and you know, there's a lot of research on this. So earn success is number one. And number two is the belief that you're making life better for somebody else. That's what creates true meaning. And then the magic is when you have earned success and service to others in the context of a community. Now, here's the key thing. I mean, people are like, why is there such a great resignation going on? Well, because ha maybe half of your compensation is your money. The other part is, is these intangible rewards. I mean, you need the money to pay your rent. I got it. But these int intangible rewards of earning your success and serving other people, but most importantly, doing it with your friends, this is a big deal. These companies are like, yeah, I can save tons of money by making everybody really productive by being remote forever. And people are like, yeah, that's fine with me. Because once again, your, your, your executive center of your brain is inhibited by loneliness. It's inhibited by being all by yourself, which is not natural. And so you make the wrong choice and say, yeah, I'll stay home forever because working in my pajamas, awesome. And, and then the result of it is, I can't you figure out why you're, you feel empty with your job. You don't like your job. That's because you're a lonely person and you're developing signs of anxiety and depression which is being foisted upon you by the fact that you're, you continue to be, you know, with this paranoid society where somebody might get the coronavirus so nobody gets to see each other ever, which is insanity. It's a mental health crisis that's washing across the country because of the, the paranoia that we all, this collective insanity that we all have about this whole situation. And then the economists are scratching their heads. How come everybody's quitting their jobs? Well, how could everybody not be quitting their jobs under these circumstances?